Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's Hunt Institute Race and Education webinar on the marginalization of black girls and women in education. We're so grateful that you decide to make time in your busy schedules to come and join with us and have this critical conversation, the last critical conversation we're having in the Race and Education webinar series for this year. Uh, and to lead this conversation, we have the Honorable Juliana Stratton, Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Jennifer mcgowan Tomke, Chief Operating Officer of the National Alliance on Mental Illness Chicago, Kayla Patrick, Senior E-12 Policy Analyst at the Education Trust, and Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland, Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois Chicago. So thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation today. Extremely excited. We want to give a moment before we actually begin. I want to thank our team at the Hunt Institute, Jen, Abigail, Cheryl, uh, Ramon, Keebler, Joni, and Michelle for all of your hard work behind the scenes making this conversation happen uh, on the marginalization of Black girls and women in education. Again, led by the Honorable Juliana Stratton, Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, Jennifer mcgowan Tomke, Chief Operating Officer at the National Alliance on Mental Illness Chicago, Kayla Patrick, Senior P-12 through Policy Analyst at the Education Trust, and Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland, Associate Professor of History at the University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, we wanna make sure that you're engaging with us online, so please use the hashtag race and education. Again, please use the hashtag race and education to communicate with us on Twitter and to hear your perspectives and your engagement. Again, we're so grateful and we're gonna get the conversation started right now. I'm gonna pass the mic over to our president and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, the Hunt Institute's fearless leader. Thank you, Senegal, uh, and welcome to everybody to our final conversation of, uh, in 2020 on race and education. As Senegal mentioned, I, I do have the great honor of serving as the president of Hunt Institute the Institute was created by four-term North Carolina Governor Jim Hunt to be a resource for policymakers, administrators, educators, seeking to champion equity in education. Uh, as part of this specific series, we've, we've been able to host a wide array of powerful conversations interrogating some of the most pressing issues of racial equity in American education. Our conversation today focuses on the systemic forces that contribute to the marginalization of black girls and women in education. For our black girls in our schools, pursuing an education is often fraught with a range of obstacles that are not encountered by their white counterparts. Age compression, where black girls are perceived to be older than their white peers, leads to harsher punishments. And the evidence demonstrates that these punishments, often in the form of suspensions and in some cases expulsions, are rapidly introducing black girls to the juvenile and criminal justice systems, making them the fastest growing population in these systems. This is a problem that continues to disenfranchise large contingents of black girls, limiting their futures in tangible and significant ways long before they've truly started living. For this important conversation, we're joined by an incredible group of people invested in interrupting these cycles. I wanna thank all of our panelists today for your willingness to discuss issues facing black girls and women in our education system. I also wanna thank, uh, a special thanks uh, to Governor Stratton a Han Kane Leadership Fellow uh, for approaching the Hunt Institute with the idea for this conversation. As noted in many of the promotional materials you saw in the lead up to this uh, conversation today, uh, this, this session, this convening here was inspired by the Lieutenant Governor's uh, Walk, Listen and Learn, Our Journey to Justice podcast. Uh, you can find a link to that series in the chat. Uh, please do take it up, it's a, she's got a great podcast. Uh, as we near the close of the year, though, we're feeling an immense sense of gratitude for the many conversations we've been able to host in this webinar series. So I thank you uh, to all of you who have joined us, uh, who are joining us today for the first time, but those of you who I know have joined us for this entire journey. We look forward to continuing the journey in the new year. Uh, so please have a safe and happy holidays. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our fearless leader, the uh, Governor Stratton, to get this conversation started. Thank you, Governor. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Javed, uh, for your leadership and your visionary leadership, quite frankly, of the Hunt Institute as president. And I'd also like to acknowledge Director Ramon de Jesus for hosting both of you for this hosting this conversation, as well as to you, Senegal Mabry, for helping to facilitate this important discussion. To each of the panelists, Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland, 
Jennifer McGowan Tomke and Kayla Patrick, thank you for sharing your expertise. I'll have you introduce yourselves shortly, but just know how excited I am to learn from each of you today. And to all of you joining us today, thank you for gathering in this virtual space to engage around this critically important issue, the marginalization of black girls and women in education. I look forward to your contributions through questions and comments throughout the hour. Again, I am Juliana Stratton and I'm proud to serve as the 48th Lieutenant Governor of Illinois. My portfolio includes leading the Justice, Equity and Opportunity Initiative, which is housed in my office and tasked with bringing an equity lens to policymaking in state government. Now, statutorily, I chair several boards and councils and committees, including the Restore, Reinvest and Renew Board, or what we call R3, which invests 25% of the net tax revenues from adult use cannabis sales in communities throughout our state that have been most harmed by the failed war on drugs. I also chair the Illinois Council on Women and Girls, the Governor's Rural Affairs Council, and several other councils. Yet today I am participating not only as the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, but also as a black woman and the mother of four black daughters, the youngest being just four years old. And as one who has, who has spent my entire life wondering and feeling the uncertainty of how my daughters would be received and treated in this world. Just this week, there's been some really infuriating news out of Chicago. Some of you have, may have seen my statement about it on social media as it gives context to today's conversation. It was of police body cam footage of Chicago police officers issuing a no-knock warrant. And Jeanette Young, a black social worker who lived there in that home, was in her home alone, and in the middle of changing clothes when a group of nine or 10 officers barged in, she was naked and they handcuffed her. And she told them 43 times that they were not in the right place, that they were in the wrong home. She cried and screamed for decency and found none. She was humiliated, dehumanized and not believed. And black women and girls are often not believed. We are often marginalized. And this is rooted in systemic racism that is found at the intersection of gender and race. And it begins before we are even born. Black women have the highest maternal mortality rates and we're less likely to have access to quality prenatal care. And once the baby is born and grows and enters school, systemic racism continues. And while black children are curious and creative, too often they are characterized as being disruptive and end up being suspended and expelled at disproportionate rates to their counterparts. In fact, when I was in the state legislature, I sponsored and worked very hard to pass a bill to end preschool expulsions in Illinois. Yeah, you heard me right. Three and four-year-olds were getting expelled from preschool, disproportionately black boys, but black girls were right behind them at ever increasing rates. And the disparities with harsh disciplinary practices that black girls experience continue through elementary and high school, which is why I don't just talk about a school to prison pipeline, I talk about the preschool to prison pipeline. This pipeline impacts black girls' ability and desire to learn, and that in turn impacts their chances for good scholarships and jobs and still rooted in systemic racism is linked to why black women are paid 63 cents to the dollar compared to what their white male counterparts make and why right here in Illinois, 33% of black women live in poverty. So it is a cycle of stress and daily trauma that is the foundation in what we look at when we consider education policy and practices. But we can end this cycle by educating and advocacy and through concrete policy changes that are centered in equity. And we can change the cycle through discussions like today to bring awareness and to help people understand what we can do as next steps. So let's meet our panelists today. I'm gonna to ask them again to briefly introduce themselves. We're gonna start with Kayla Patrick and then we'll move to Jennifer mcgowan Tomkey and finish up with Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland. Kayla, if you can begin. 
Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here to be talking with you all about this really important topic. Um, my name is Kayla Patrick. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Education Trust, where I lead our work on school climate and college and career readiness. Thank you, Jen. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Jen McGowan Tomke. I am the Chief Operating Officer at NAMI Chicago, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I am so happy to be here with all of you and uh, with Lieutenant Governor Stratton. Thank you so much for having me. Um, NAMI Chicago is the local affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and we are a mental health advocacy organization that focuses on. Um, bringing education around mental health and mental wellness, advocacy, and um, supporting individuals as they access services. And we do, um, we have done a lot of work and paid a lot of attention to the intersection of the criminal court system, the juvenile justice system, and mental health. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Breland. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Todd Breland. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, my areas of research expertise are urban history, African-American history, and the history of education. And I also um, do research on the history of Black women's activism and organizing. Um, I'm also a member of the Chicago Board of Education and very much present here today also as a Black woman, as a Black mother, and a mother of two young Black girls. Well, thank you all for being here today and again for sharing your expertise and your knowledge base on these issues. Um, so this first question is going to go to all of three of you. Um, how has the criminalization of girls and young women of color in the education system impacted their educational, social, emotional, and professional futures? Uh, and I really would love it if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of the defining hallmarks of this problem. What is happening and how does it impact where young Black girls and young Black women, their sort of future outcomes and trajectory? Who would like to start? I can start. Um, so I, I think this is a really important question and it's really important that we start at the place that who black girls are when they start when they enter school buildings right so black girls are more likely to see themselves as leaders black girls are resilient black girls are creative they are ready to learn and they want to learn however they go to schools in systems that were not designed to support their social emotional well-being and we know that through the stories the countless stories that we hear in the news media right so recently we've heard a story of a six-year-old being handcuffed because she took a piece of candy off of her teacher's desk or an 11 year old who was body slammed by a school resource officer because she took too many milks from the cafeteria, right? Or a 16 year old who was dragged down the, um, the stairs in Chicago because she didn't put her phone away when she was asked to. And so these, these minor and subjective offenses that um, black girls are often excluded for, um, they experience some kind of trauma or stress as a result to happen way too often in schools. And these aren't just one off instances, right? These are just the instances that journalists have um, highlighted in the media, but there are countless more. And we know that from the data. And we know from the data that black girls, as you said, Lieutenant Governor, experience exclusion from the day that they enter preschool, right? So black girls are 20% of girls enrolled in preschools, but they are over half the girls who are suspended from preschool. And these just being suspended just one time, just once, increases the likelihood that you don't graduate from high school, that you don't have a, 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 a job that pays a living wage, that you don't have access to that quality health care, which um, can lead to those outcomes of, such as having poor maternal uh, uh, mortality rates. And so all of these things compound for black girls, even though they are resilient, or we are resilient, um, all these things compound to make really large barriers. And it happens way too frequently. And there are lots of things that we can do to really support their social emotional well being and realize that schools should not be the source of girls trauma and stress. Yeah, Jen, can you pick up on that because I think this concept about social emotional well being for black girls, you're with NAMI Chicago. Talk a little bit more about this question of this trajectory impact. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's an, an important thread to continue in that um, we're talking about resilience. We're talking about the inherent traits that 
that um, young women and black, black girls come to school with. And we're talking about the systems that fight against that resilience, right? Um, so I think that there's a, a piece of, of this conversation around how do schools um, cultivate resilience that's already there and continue to build that. Because we know that some of the impacts here relate to increased stress, increased anxiety, and even can relate to trauma. And those are the things that these systems need to be protecting against, right? In order for Black young women and girls to thrive in the educational system and in their lives, we, uh, we need a healthy foundation and a foundation that we may start with, but then is, uh, it becomes detrimental because of how these systems uh, push up against people. Um, I would also say that, you know, we um, heard that, um, that are increased numbers of black women and girls who are in the juvenile justice system. And that impact is really significant because the juvenile justice system can be traumatizing in and of itself, can lead to increased mental health conditions, can lead to poor educational attainment and other health outcomes. And those are the things that we need to dis disconnect here because the examples, Kayla, that you raised are astounding and they're not criminal. And we need to make sure that those things are um, not associated and not leading one to the other, the preschool to prison pipeline, because of the very serious health impacts that those systems have on people. Absolutely, thank you. And Dr. Breland, I think the same thing, like we both talked about being mothers of black daughters and this idea of wanting the school, you know, when you think of school of being a place to really kind of build you up and help you become what you want to be. And yet recognizing that sometimes when they come as their full selves, part of the school system says, no, don't be that. And you have to have this balancing act. What do you see in terms of how it affects black, the trajectory of black girls and young women? Yeah, I mean, just building on some of the comments and some of the really, you know, unfortunate statistics that exist about the way that that joy is snuffed out, right? That curiosity is snuffed out, that um, humanity is denied. Um, we know that five to seven times more nationally, black girls are more likely than their white peers to be suspended. Um, they're three times more likely to be restrained and referred to law enforcement. They're four times more likely to be arrested. And that this, as was mentioned, has really long-term impacts that disciplinary actions of this kind are tied um, to exclusionary discipline, but also to the presence of police in schools, and that these things increase student involvement in the criminal legal system, that this harms black girls' social, emotional, psychological, and academic development, um, that it fuels and perpetuates a school to prison pipeline, which was mentioned, but for, particularly for black girls, uh, can also become an entry into being trafficked, um, so a sort of uh, suspension to, sex, to sexual exploitation pipeline. Um, and that, that these individual adverse childhood experiences that may be happening in the school setting or outside of the school setting lead to other adverse childhood experiences then, that one comes after the other because of the ways in which um, young Black girls are subjected to these experiences. And I think also was mentioned um, by Jen and also by Kayla about what toxic stress does and the increasing research that we see about toxic stress um, and the evidence of long-term impacts of for both the interruption of education and educational attainment, but also lifetime earnings, mental health, um, victimization, or becoming a perpetuator of violence later in life, all of these things can be tied to what we see happening in school buildings when essentially we know and we desire for that not to be the purpose of schooling. Absolutely, and I, I think I wanna stay with you, Dr. Breland, because I think you've touched on it. You've touched about these different sort of pipelines. Can you talk a little bit about how black women and girls uh, have been criminalized historically and how this shows up in the education system in particular? Absolutely. So we certainly have a long history in this country of Black women and girls being criminalized, um, being framed as deviant and less worthy of protection or care. Um, from the time Africans were captured and brought to this country, enslaved and treated as property. This was an exploitation based on human beings being valued for their labor, including particularly for Black women, their reproductive labor. 
Um, and I think about this continuing on after the you know, official end of slavery in the late 19th century. Um, and there's a historian named Sarah Haley who writes about this criminalization of black women and girls during Jim Crow. And she talks about, I'm gonna quote her here. She said, she reveals how the criminal legal system crafted, reinforced and required black female deviance as part of a broader constitution of Jim, Jim Crow modernity premised on the devaluation and dehumanization of black life more broadly. And I think one of the things this points to and that was alluded to Lieutenant Governor in your opening comments is the way in which um, there, the intersectionality of the experiences of black women and girls. And Kimberly Crenshaw talks about this, about understanding the multiple and compounding forms of oppression and the power dynamics in there. And this historian, Sarah Haley talks about black women's deviance then from the category of woman being used to justify their incarceration and assault. And so this lack of uh, recognition of humanity and dignity of black women and girls is this thread that we see that changes in context, but continues to be present. And it's already been lifted up both by you, Lieutenant Governor, and by Kayla about Anjanette Young um, and the experience that she had. Uh, and I, and Denigma Howard, who you spoke of, the young 16 year old who was dragged down a set of stairs in a Chicago public school um, by a police officer because she was using her cell phone. And I, th these have been certainly present on my mind as a Chicagoan this week, both because this video was released this week, but also because the settlement for Denigma Howard's trauma was up for vote yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. And so these things continue to happen. And so what does this, to your point, look like in contemporary schooling? Certainly it can look like moments of tragedy and trauma, like what happened to Denigma Howard, but it can also be punitive policies and practices that are often the only tools used or the tools more quickly used for black girls. Um, it can look like black girls being suspended for behaviors that are indicative of or responses to trauma. So attitude, right? Um, this relates to things like adultification. And there's this research that comes out of Georgetown and other uh, places where it talks about treating black girls more like adults. So less innocent, um, less worthy of protection and empathy as early as age five. Right, so to your point about this preschool, right? And it's already been talked about, but this relationship again between black girls being pushed out of schools and then disproportionately the rate of those black girls who end up being trafficked. So starting to being groomed to be trafficked during the time that you're suspended and put out of school. And so all of these, again, these are these long standing issues of criminalization of black women and girls. The context certainly has changed over time, um, but the outcomes are no less tragic. The outcomes are no less tragic, and these are outcomes that continue on into womanhood. So the idea of when you talk about, um, uh, you know, the attitude or kind of this stereotype of like you're you're this strong black woman that doesn't you can come into the workforce and take any kind of treatment and it shouldn't bother you. It's the same kind of thing that that adultification in young black girls, and then this thought that that nothing kind of bothers us and that we're just resilient and can come in. There's a very devaluing of the humanity that we all have. Uh, you know, Kayla, I wanna turn to you. Uh, and I'm a restorative justice practitioner and a trained peace circle keeper and I'm an advocate for restorative practices. Uh, and can you talk just a little bit about how restorative justice can help create better and safer environments for black girls and women in the education system? And I know a lot of that work is to move away from these harsh, disciplinary practices into one that allows us to be in spaces as our full selves and understanding relationships one with another and repairing harm that has been done. Talk a little bit about the role of restorative justice in this work. Absolutely. So schools across the country are starting to adapt restorative justice. And it's important to note that not all of them are doing it well because it does take a lot of resources, right? And when schools do do it well, they hire and train educators to really um, to really practice restorative justice um, practices within schools. So what restorative justice does is it offers a less punitive and more positive alternative to addressing school-based conflicts, right? And so at its core, it's about um, building community, as you said, and giving space to learn and grow from mistakes, which suspensions and expulsions and arrest don't do. They deny students their humanity and really deny them the opportunity to learn and grow from their mistakes. And really, instead of asking what happened and who did it and who should be punished, which our criminal system does and the schools often do, 
it really asks who was harmed, what that person needs, and how they can work together to give that person what they need. And that's really, really important um, to give students agency and support and help them to learn how to resolve conflicts, right? And help them to grow and learn from them, their mistakes. And that's why restorative justice is so, so very important. And really what I found when I talked to students across the country is that they really like restorative justice. They really like that opportunity to talk things out and really learn from their behavior and mistakes that we all inevitably make, especially as children. Um, and they really enjoy the opportunity to, to work together to resolve conflicts. And it's really also um, important to note that restorative justice works not just between students and other students, but students and educators as well, who often uh, inflict some kind of stress or trauma on students. And so really in, um, practicing restorative justice between everyone in school communities is important. Thank you. You know, it's important and it is a place of healing the way that I look at it, because as we all know, in the restorative justice world, we say that hurt people hurt people. And so the trauma that might even be from those in the educational system often then gets inflicted upon the children in that system and vice versa, hurt people hurt people, but there's a power imbalance there. And so we have to recognize that. But at the same time, healed people heal people. And so the idea of creating space for that healing so that those who might have experienced trauma can now be in the role of healing in the educational system is important. So Jen, can you talk a little bit about how being marginalized affects the mental health of girls and young women of color and, and kind of talk about that space for how uh, maybe teachers, we recognize the role of teachers or educators is to educate but the environment that our young girls of color and black girls in particular for this conversation, how does being marginalized affect them and their mental health in particular? Absolutely, I, it, it's a really, I think, important question because it threads as we were talking about um, the experience in childhood and young womenhood into adulthood and, and um, what we see in the mental health system of the impacts on adults, it started in this space. So I think that you know one thing that we talked about around marginalization is that it can it create stress for young people, it can create anxiety for young people, and it also can um, it, it be a traumatic experience. And so just to define that um, quickly in what we mean by trauma is we're really talking about an emotional response to something terrible that happens. It can be an accident, can be a natural disaster, but it's something that threatens our safety. And the examples that we've talked about today are certainly examples where Black young women and girls have a, a sense of safety um, threatened by the experience. And really when we're talking about childhood trauma, we're talking about this intense feeling of being threatened and it can happen to the individual or it can happen to a loved one. And so we talk about the cumulative piece here too of seeing of the exposure that young uh, black women and girls have to other young women and girls and what they are experiencing. That, um, vicariousness, that cumulativeness, all impacts our ability to, or our mental wellness. Um, and that's not to say that everyone who experiences a trauma will be traumatized or will um, have the same reaction as others, because as we've talked about, resilience is an incredibly important part of this conversation. And it is a, it is a mitigation factor. It is a coping uh, a strategy, a coping ability. And it's really important that we, um, build on those resiliency factors. And I just wanted to comment because I think the restorative justice practices are a great example of policy that builds resilience, right? It is an alternative to punishment. It is a different approach. And by coming together as community, recognizing harm and fixing that, we are actually um, practicing uh, resilience building too. And so we need to see some of those strategies transition because just to comment quickly that, you know, getting into adulthood, the uh, individual, um, black individuals who live with mental health conditions are less likely to receive the care that they need. They are more likely to have poor uh, quality of mental health services um, to get consistent care that is aligned with guidelines. They're less likely to be involved in research. And so the, the strategies and interventions used um, may not be the right ones. And they're more likely to use emergency rooms or um, primary care versus specialty care. And all of that impacts 
our ability to recover um, in living with mental health conditions, and it's uh, that it's inequitable and um, it is not consistent. And so we need to address the prevention piece that exists mm -hmm. in the school system and in the community early on and prevent, right? Prevent these interactions that marginalize and criminalize black women and girls to also prevent the long-term outcomes that relate to mental health conditions. Thank you, Jen. You know what, I wanna, uh, first of all, I, I love thinking about this question of or understanding trauma as threatening our safety. Because I think that's why we see these hashtags, hashtag protect black girls, hashtag protect black women, because there's too many spaces where black women and girls do not feel safe. And that in and of itself is traumatizing. I wanna to turn to some of the questions. We have a good uh, robust Q and A going, uh, and please feel free to add your questions for our panelists to answer. I first just wanna thank Brianna for her uh, comment that she recommends the book, Push Out the Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools by Monique Morris. And you see a lot of nodding heads there. So that is noted, push out the criminalization of black girls in schools by Monique Morris. Uh, I wanna get to Ari's question who, uh, thank you for your question, Ari. I'm currently in graduate school, but I'm looking to get into the federal government in an attempt to change educational policy to support students and teachers of color, including black ones from these kinds of experiences. What is the best way to focus my attention to advance and enact progress with those goals in mind? Or alternatively, what are ways that graduate students can fight against these injustices to promote organized change? Uh, Kayla, do you wanna talk about that first? Sure, I'd be happy to. I think um, there are lots of ways to get involved, right, especially right now in terms of the changing of who is running the department of the Federal Department of Education. So the first thing I would suggest is um, looking at the, I think in, the, in 2014, the Obama administration put out um, guidance around school discipline. And unfortunately, a couple years ago, this last administration rescinded that guidance. And what we're really hoping is to see that guidance come back and not just come back the same way it did before, right? But come back and center the needs of black girls who are um, who face some of the biggest disparities in schools. And so I would suggest you just contacting your local um, congressperson or your, your senator and asking them to um, really push uh, the administration to really bring that back up and really highlight the needs of um, black students and black girls. And that's just one simple thing that you can do to kind of get started and get your foot in the door. But as we move forward, we really hope that the federal government does a lot more to offer supports to schools um, across the country to really enact some of these changes, right? It costs money to put a restorative justice coordinator in every single school. And so some states cannot cover that cost and really could use the support from the federal government to provide that implicit and explicit, sometimes we know it's not always implicit, bias training to our educators and making sure that they know how to interact with all students in their classroom and really support the social and emotional development of every single child in their classroom. And so those are just some of the things that come to mind immediately. Thank you. And, and Dr. Breland, I want you to pick up on this because you talk quite a bit about the role of young people in sort of leading the way on a lot of these changes. So that second part of Ari's question about ways graduate students can really be a part, play a role in changing, making change, you know, high schoolers and others have been very influential on both you and me. So what do you, what is your thought for Ari? Yeah, I mean, I think my biggest um, suggestion is to see who's already doing this work in your local community and connect with them. There is so much work going on and it's not all new work around trying to address these issues and these disparities. I'm really glad that someone um, spoke about Monique Morris. Some of the statistics I was mentioning earlier are from her book. Um, it also now is a documentary and it's an excellent education resource. If you go to the push, I think it's push out film website. They have a lot of great resources also um, for educators. But to your point about young people, I mean, here in the state of Illinois, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen the immense power of young people to push in this direction. Um, I think of the work of Voices of Youth in Chicago Education, a group of young um, black and brown organizers, largely led by women and queer folks. Um, and they led the work to end zero tolerance policies statewide to replace punitive with non-punitive options um, to reduce suspension. And they pushed this and passed and, and helped to pass legislation at the state level around this. Um, 
I think certainly this summer uh, during the uprisings that took place, not just here in Chicago, but nationally, we saw a wave of young people, often largely led by young black women, um, pushing to remove police from schools. You can connect with folks in your community working on that. And I think just to your point, Gov uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, the importance of listening to young people. Uh, I'll lift up one example here in Chicago with Chicago Public Schools of um, CPS students, a student advisory group who put recommendations forth um, to Chicago Public Schools administrators about how to transform in-school suspensions um, and, and transform the use of that. And as a board member, I got to vote on policies then that put those ideas that were really supported by young people in our buildings into effect um, about reimagining school suspension. So there are so many of these examples and opportunities across the country. Um, and so I see what's happening in your local community and connect with those folks. Thank you. I, I want to shift gears just a little bit because um, while, I, you know, I, at first I looked at this next question and I was like, well, how does it directly relate? But I think it does relate very clearly. And Susan, thank you for your question. You asked the question about, is there more that we can do to follow up to the Crown Act? And the Crown Act, of course, relates to um, prohibiting discrimination based on natural hair. And uh, we know that there are so many cases re regarding uh, Black women and girls uh, really being either disciplined, some being sent home, uh, things happening with natural hair. As someone who wears my hair naturally, I can say that Solange had the uh, sort of theme of the, of the decade when she said, don't touch my hair. And the concept of someone coming in and touching your hair out of curiosity and what that means. But on a more serious note, literally people being disciplined in their jobs as well as in school because of how they wear their hair and it, the hair being the way that it grows out of their head. So uh, Kayla, I'm gonna start with you, but. Jen, I'm also going to ask you to follow up because I think about, you talked about resilience and this idea of how it affects your mental health when someone does not accept your features in the way that you were created to be versus thinking that there is this sort of, um, there's the right way to look or the right way to wear your hair or what's the professional way. That also has a mental health. So Kayla, any thoughts on, uh, again, and you talked about advocacy before, uh, but what about in following up to the Crown Act and why this is important as we think about Black women and girls in, in the education system? Absolutely. So unfortunately, the Crown Act applies to workplaces and doesn't often apply to school buildings. And so really the first thing we need to do is make sure that applies to school buildings. And one of the biggest drivers for suspensions for Black girls, particularly, are dress code and hair code violations, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we have seen D.C. and Virginia, for example, really make it clear that schools are not to suspend or expel or remove students from the classroom for dress code or hair code violations. And that's really, really important. And we should see all states do the same thing, right? Because girls should be welcomed to, into school buildings regardless of what they're wearing or what their hair looks like. And really what we've seen, I see, I did a report with black girls in DC a couple years ago and they told, they told us that, you know, they are suspended for very minor dress code violations. So girls are sent home for wearing the wrong color shoes, right? Or not wearing the right color pants to school or told that their braids are distracting. These things are embedded in school policies and codes. You can look at, at your dress code policy and likely the first thing you will see is a ban on a head wrap or a hair wrap or something that is really closely tied to our culture and what we and who we are and our identities. And really taking that out of dress code policies is critically important, even if we cannot pass cr something similar to the Crown Act at state and federal levels. Thank you so much. And that's wonderful context. To me, and that's an action item that can be worked on. Jen, anything you wanna add about just the impact from a mental health standpoint on these types of disciplinary practices? Yeah, I would call out a couple of things. One being, um, I just, I want to maybe call out that we're talking about young people, um, Black girls and young women. And if we think for a second about our biological factors, our brain development, and what it means to feel pressure as a, a young girl or young woman around self-worth, self-identity, acceptance, all of these characteristics are things that pe young people are developing right at this time. And if we are systematically telling people that they're wrong or the way that they look is wrong and they can't act a, a way that they are, we are, I think, directly impacting 
our wellness, right? Because of how we perceive ourselves and the influence that this time in a young person's life really has in development. So it's not just, I mean, I think we need to ground in this idea that young people are developing at these times and we are directly contributing to those perceptions when we create these, um, it, it, these, uh, standards that are not appropriate. And the other thing I would say is there's a lot of talk about trauma-informed practices. Sometimes we hear that as healing-centered practices. And as schools think about that, these are the policies that they need to be considering. Because when we really get down to trauma-informed practices, what we're asking people to do is show empathy and compassion for others and walk in their shoes, like you like to say, Lieutenant Governor Stratton. And so that those are the policies that we have to be thinking about. What is the impact? How are they? How is it not showing empathy or compassion for others and their life experiences? And how do we change and address those things? Absolutely, thank you. You know, Dr. Breland, I'm going to address the next question to you, and I'm going to kind of combine two questions: one from Christina, one that's from an anonymous attendee, but I think they're related. Christina's question is: How do you affect change? in a school district that is resistant and even hostile to DEI efforts or diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. But there's someone else um, who said, so much of what has been shared hints at the interlocking systems of oppression that come to bear upon Black folks generally and Black folks, Black girls and women specifically as they enter school is pushing back against these punitive practices enough or should we be pushing for a broader movement that transforms education and schools to be places that encourage, acknowledge, and support the whole person. So I combine those two because I think they both kind of talk about sort of systems change and how do you go about it, um, especially when there may be some resistance in a particular district. Yeah, I mean, I think to your point and to what everyone's been saying, a lot of folks have been focusing on what are the policies, not, not just the practices, but what are the institutionalized policies that can be put in place to have a long lasting impact? And I think that's what both of these um, questions are asking. And I'm, as a historian, I really feel like the tension between those in power and a powerful grassroots movement, one, progress doesn't happen without that ladder, right? So the power of movements, the power of people, the power of listening to communities, the power of community organizing to push those in power to make decisions, that's how change has happened historically for black people, right? Um, and I think that that continues to be a necessary element of this. I think on a, to the first part of the question about sometimes, I don't wanna call it sneaky ways, but kind of <laughs> trying to get to what you want as an outcome. Uh, one, one way I would suggest is that, um, sometimes these questions can be framed in terms of transparency. So for example, it is not a, it is not a, a ridiculous request to ask for all data that is given you know, or provided to be disaggregated by both race and gender and being attentive to the uh, intersection between the two, because if you're not, you miss black girls, right? Um, and so once that data is out there, there becomes greater pressure to respond to the disparities, to respond to opportunity gaps that emerge. And so I think by asking for greater transparency around data, to greater transparency around information, um, that that is one way to start to also push if you're more sort of within an institution um, as well. And then in places where there are DEI efforts underway that folks want to sort of push further, I think being very clear in having people put forth um, vision and action statements, and particularly that action statement part, right? Um, I think we saw particularly this summer, not just educational institutions, but all of these, you know, various institutions talking about racial reckoning and, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, without the actions that necessarily come with that. Um, and so I think that is also a place to push for those things. And again, just as an example um, here in Chicago, so we have, we now have an office of equity within Chicago public schools and an equity framework. And that equity framework is now something that people can draw upon as a point of accountability, right? These are the things that are stated in that equity framework. How are we then seeing those things? And so it becomes to the point about the power of policy um, that that is something to be measured against. I think this is especially critical when we talk about DEI, uh, because I know that there are a lot of folks who would say, you know, these statements sound great. I'm glad that it's something that you say is something that is driving your work. 
Uh, it's a great framework, but we're not seeing the real inclusion. So it's being going beyond just numbers or slogans, or hashtags or statements, but to creating real policy change that will actually be measured. And as you said, the data is so important because if we don't have the data, we can't measure it. We can't actually go back and say, did this policy change make a difference? And we have to do that in a disaggregated way so that we can see, does it specifically affect black women and girls? Um, I know we have just a limited amount of time. Kayla, one thing I wanted to get to you before I ask a final question to all three of you is about just kind of what's in place and working now. I mean, you do a lot of work and you see the sort of the national landscape. What are some of the supports and interventions that are really helping right now to disrupt systemic racism in education? Yeah, so this is a great question and I'm so happy that you asked it because uh, it's really important to note that black girls haven't been at the center of policy in schools um, very long, right? And so thinking about um, Oakland example, for example, from where I'm from, um, they had lots of policies in place that really supported black boys and men. But when you talk to black girls, they really felt left out of that, right? We are struggling too, and you have left us out of the conversation. And really one thing that I saw in Oakland that I absolutely loved, I saw a social worker create a class and a space for just black girls to come and talk about what, what they're dealing with in school, everything from academic classes to social um, issues and really build that relationship with a per, an adult in the school building. And they, they had a strong relationship with her. And because they had that strong relationship, they wanted to come to school. They felt safe in school because there was someone who cared about them and supported their growth in that school. And so that's really important to just offering space and mentorship um, and building strong relationships within school buildings is not, is not appreciated enough in, in education, I think. And so really making that space for girls is really important. Um, I've also just mentioned um, Oakland also did another thing, which Dr. Todd Breland talked about a little bit. They invited girls to the table to help create a harassment policy. Um, this is this is really important because girls are the ones that are facing harassment in schools, so they their voice needs to be heard and they need to be listened to. So building creating policies alongside students is critically important. They are the experts, right? They're in school buildings every day. They know what happens, and so school districts across the country can really do that and really make a lot of change by just inviting the community, not just students, but the larger community, in to co-create policies that work for that particular school. It's really, really important and it works. It really helps schools, students to feel like they belong in school buildings because they help create the thing that um, helps them to feel supported. Absolutely, I mean, that is really the foundation of restorative justice. As we say, the wisdom is in the room. And so uh, include the voices of black girls and the community surrounding them in the solutions for them. Um, so let me ask one last question. By the way, thank you for reminding me. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Todd Breland. I'm sorry that I was missing the Todd. I'm going to keep. I'm going to add that as we finish this up. Um, but I want to close. And, and there's been some great comments and questions in the chat, and I hope you all will take a peek at that because there's there's so much interest in this topic, and I'm glad. And we'll keep having these conversations. But more importantly, we'll be working on solutions. Um, so for the policymakers, the administrators, the education leaders that are on the call today, what is just one thing that they can do to interrupt the outcomes that we've discussed, which negatively impact back black girls and young women of color? Just one thing that as we leave this conversation today, that is an action item that people can do that are tuning in today or who will watch this at a later date. Jen, I'm going to start with you. I'm then going to go to Dr. Todd Breland, and then I'm going to go to you, Kayla, to close this out. Thanks, Lieutenant Governor. Um, I, I will cheat a little and say, if we're talking about just one thing, I'm going to give a comprehensive thought in that, um, similar to what Kayla has mentioned, that um, policymakers and leaders should really reframe and reinvent what wellness looks like in schools. And that includes several fronts. It is um, ensuring that um, Black women and girls are involved in the conversation in shaping those new policies and strategies. It is, you know, from our perspective at NAMI Chicago, we're thinking about mental health services, right? So it's investing in those mental health services in schools and healing centered practices in schools. And we actually have some policy solutions available to us 
um, in Medicaid policy uh, around uh, the free care rule and changing some um, small Medicaid policy to free up some resources uh, within the school systems. But there's also the community investment that needs to happen because uh, women and girls don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in communities, in families, and the uh, community wellness is interconnected with individual wellness. So we have to be thinking about that comprehensively and setting up those services, but supports as well that build resilience and build um, community and continuing to rethink our transform or continuing to move along the transformation of the juvenile court system, the juvenile justice system, and um, really uh, creating, uh, disconnecting um, these pieces of mental health and the court system and getting folks served in the places that they need to be served, which is generally in the healthcare system um, and away from our sort of public safety system. So that was a mouthful, but one thing if you think about the, overarching statements. See, I, I love how you push that, Jen. I asked for one, you gave me about five or six, but they're all really good ones. So I'm glad that you shared them. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Todd Breland. Well, I'm going to um, pick up on Jen and of course not just give one answer. So I have one process and one tool. And so the process that I want to lift up has already been mentioned um, by both my fellow panelists here and you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, um, which is really about crafting solutions to these problems with Black girls and to see Black girls as leaders, as experts, as was mentioned, but as leaders in this work and that they have to be at the table to make decisions on what their needs are, to be able to speak to their needs, to be able to create and craft solutions to the problems that they're facing um, and to create those affirming spaces too, because that's part of the solution. And then in terms of a tool, I do just wanna come back again to Monique Morris's work um, with Push Out, whether it is the, um, the book or using the film and the website that accompanies the film, it has a great set of tools and resources for educators, for policymakers, for administrators um, that do some, some of this work of centering black women and girls in these conversations. Um, and I think, again, become great tools for professional learning around this to help us push this conversation forward. Thank you. And Kayla, close us out. I'm also going to cheat a little bit and, and say that I, I do agree that the first thing you need to do is an equity audit, not only of the data, but of the policies, right? So find out who's being suspended disproportionately. You will probably find that Black girls are five to six times more likely to be suspended in your school or district, right? And then the thing that doesn't cost any money is print out your code of conduct, your school discipline, um, policies or your dress code policies and really look at it to do an interrogation of who is being targeted by those policies, right? Who's being excluded from school for, by those policies? Is the discipline policy clear? Do the parents and students know what the discipline policy is? All of these things are really critically important and don't cost a dollar for you to do. Um, and the Education Trust alongside the National Women's Law Center created a checklist where you can um, use the checklist to really interrogate those policies and find out if there is bias and racism and sexism embedded in those policies. The second thing I would do is I would um, take a look at who is getting suspended, when they're getting suspended. You might find that in your school or district, kids are only being suspended after lunchtime, right? Something like that. You might find that a certain group of teachers are responsible for the vast majority of um, suspensions, expulsions, or referrals, whatever it is in your school district. Really finding out what's happening in your schools is important because you can give educators and students targeted support, right? You can give that group of educators the professional development that they need or the, the support that they need, whether that be another person in their classroom to really keep students in school. And so what I would really suggest is a comprehensive equity audit and making the results of that audit very public so advocates and community members can really push um, to make those changes happen because we know that they don't always happen overnight, but um, advocates and community members are also important in making those changes happen. Thank you so much, really, all of you. I just wanna say before I give some closing remarks that uh, I understand that the chat is not, you cannot see the other questions and comments um, and I know that there are a, a number of things that people want to follow up on. Uh, one was, what is the name of the book that everyone's recommending, which I also saw in the, in the Q&A chat, is also a documentary film. It's called Push Out, 
The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools by Monique Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. What we just heard from our three panelists, we've heard everything from what does wellness look like and reimagining that black women and girls being involved in creating solutions, investing in mental health and wellness and healing in schools, uh, making sure that black girls are served in the healthcare system, not the criminal justice system, crafting solutions to uh, problems with black girls, again, with black girls being the leaders in this space, creating affirming spaces, uh, an equity audit of data and policies, who's being suspended or expelled or pushed out of your school district, making those results public so people can galvanize around action items, printing out the code of conduct, interrogating who's being targeted and, ex and excluded. And please know that this uh, presentation has been recorded and will be available for you to watch it again or share with others in your school systems or networks or districts. Thank you all for the energy and information and passion that you have shared with us today. We now can take what we've heard and learned and move forward in our work of pursuing equity and safe spaces for all of our children, including black girls in the realm of education. So to Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland from the University of Illinois at Chicago, Jennifer McGowan Tomke of NAMI or National Alliance of Mental Illness Chicago and Kayla Patrick from the Education Trust. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and your advocacy, your powerful advocacy on behalf of black girls. I have personally enjoyed this conversation and learned so much uh, today. I have dedicated my life to restorative justice. So I always appreciate uh, panels like this because they energize me. Uh, and even though every day I consider myself a member of the Justice League who's pushing and fighting alongside of all of you, um, it certainly means so much, especially in a year like this, when we see the sort of um, racial disparities in our face on a daily basis, uh, that it's so important to understand that there are people who are looking at what needs to happen and not just looking at it, but doing something about it. Um, that's why, by the way, my team created the podcast that was mentioned earlier called Walk, Listen, Learn, Our Journey to Justice, which was sort of the foundation for bringing us to this conversation. There are 13 episodes. Each is a short conversation on social justice. And by the way, two of them are related to today's conversation. Episode six was on mental health and trauma, and it featured a conversation with Jennifer mcgowan Tomkey. Episode eight is about the school to prison pipeline and it featured a conversation with none other than Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland. So please, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find it on Spotify, Apple or wherever, or you can go to anchor.com uh, slash Lieutenant Governor Stratton, LTGOV Stratton. Thank you all again for being here today. Uh, and I certainly appreciate all of the conversation and engagement. Let's continue to do this work together. I'm now going to turn it back over to Senegal Mabry, who will close out today's conversation. Senegal. Thank you immensely for such a powerful and engaging conversation about how to support and how to end the marginalization of Black girls and women of color. Incredibly honored to have hosted it with the Hunt Institute. And thank you to our panelists, Kayla Patrick, Jennifer McGowan Tomkey, Dr. Elizabeth Todd Breland. And thank you to you, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, for your call to action for us to move beyond the conversation but into the solutions for this work. Our next conversation in the Hunt Institute's Race and Education webinar series in 2021 will be on just that community activism and coalition building for educational equity. The link for that conversation to register in advance is in the chat now, but wanted to take a moment and thank all of you who have been on this journey with us for the Race and Education webinar series. Could not have found better panelists or better moderator and a more important and engaging topic to close out this year and to get us ready for 2021. So thank you immensely again and hope to see you on a Hunt Institute webinar soon. Happy holidays and stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.